we have our speaker is Fabio. He's the VP of Engineering at Housework, leading the feature feature store development team. And he holds a master's degree in cloud computing and services with a focus on data intensive applications. And this talk does not need prior knowledge. And mainly this workshop will be building ML systems to predict air quality. Yeah, this will be until 2.50, and I guess the last 10 minutes will be Q&A, depending on how long you want to. Okay. Oops. Okay. Actually, there's an update. Uh, we're doing loan, loan approval. Not their quality, but uh, it's the same concept. Okay. Okay. Same, 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 same ideas. Um, yeah. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Wait, wait, put on. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Fabio. Um, I did the engineering team at Opsworks. Um, Opsworks is a, a feature store company. Um, we spent the past couple of years building Opsworks. Um, and the reason we do that is some, some of the reasons will be interested them today in our workshop. Um, the workshop is actually split into two different spare. Uh, yes. Can people hear me if I speak like this? some of the components that we built in Opsworks to, um, to build them. And then um, the next section is a little bit more hands-on. Um, we have a bunch of tutorials that, that we can go through um, and look at it and so build uh, a very simple um, machine learning system to uh, predict whether or not um, a loan should be approved uh, depending on, on, on the user requesting it. Right? Um, so the reason for this workshop to be essentially is um, it's that um, if you have, if you're trained to be a data scientist, but what you often do is you often do like let's say cargo tunnels, and everybody has done them. I've done them myself as well. Um, but that's that's not the end game. That, that's not what we believe this, the end game is. The end game is to be able to build um, systems that leverage models and build applications that leverage models, um, either in production for like you know uh, company use cases and stuff, uh, but also for like you know side projects and so on, right? Um, there are different levels of machine learning, machine learning systems. Um, I would like, generally speaking, um, applications that leverage uh, uh, machine learning. Um, we start from the bottom. Uh, the bottom is what we call laptop ML. This is more like classical, like cargo challenge, where essentially you get uh, a CSV file, uh, you do some training, um, you do some predictions, and uh, enough you go. Um, that's not what we consider a machine learning system. Um, a machine learning system to be considered like that, uh, it's a system where new data continuously arrive to, 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 your, uh, to your model, whether to uh, make new predictions, and you can do that either in real time, um, so for instance, stuff like uh, recommendation system services and networks, um, gets, you know, uh, makes new predictions based on your um, most recent activities, but also you can do that in batch, right? So, um, in Opsworks is originally from Sweden. Um, Sweden is also the home of Spotify, and one of the most like um, known features they have, known capability they have in Spotify is Spotify Weekly, where every week they get basically um, they recommend for every user uh, a bunch of uh, like a bunch of um, songs that they might be interested in, right? So today we're going to be focusing on the first top two. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, how to build um, operational machine learning systems. Uh, in Python, um, leveraging Opsworks and, and leveraging some of the capabilities that, that we built in Opsworks um, uh, right now. Right, so the second motivation for this talk to be is that it's not trivial to build this type of machine learning systems. Um, and oftentimes, um, people start like, especially if you're working in a company in a in a in a 
maybe an imagined the price and so on. What you often end up doing is that, okay, I have to build models and you start looking at uh, what's my like machine learning um, uh, infrastructure, let's say, um, setup, right? And you end up with something like this on the right side. That's the most like uh, cited paper in the ML space. Um, and the reason you end up in that situation is actually two reasons. The first one is that um, people think about like, MLOps in terms of like components, not in terms of processes. And so then you know you need to have all the boxes checked out to be able to actually start start, start building stuff. Um, and the second one is that, and ultimately, and the reason why we spend time building upsource is um, ultimately putting models in production is, is a data challenge, right? A lot of the arrows going around essentially is like feeding data to different components. Um, and you know that's 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 quite chaotic, right? And especially if you are building a side project, especially if you're building like a small project, a small prototype, um, there's a lot of complexity there that you that we don't think that, that we think we don't have to deal with essentially. All right, so how do you how do we think that you should actually build this this type of systems, right? Um, if you go back, um, we think that you should look at in terms of like data flow essentially. How does data move through your model? How is data used across training your model? Um, you know, making predictions and so on, right? So, if you go back to the original uh, statement, basically saying, okay, we, we build like a, like a, we we are, we are participate to a cargo challenge, right? We get a bunch of CSV files, um, we do some training, um, and then we do some predictions. Essentially, um, that's what we define uh, like the monolithic machine learning pipeline. Because essentially there's no separation of the different stages, it's basically just one, potentially one gigantic Python script essentially, right? But if you look within that specific uh, Python script, what you actually find is that there are three um, separate stages, let's say, you can, you can identify, right? Um, you can have a, like a feature pipeline, which is basically the one actually com computing the features. Um, you take the features from the feature pipeline and then you actually build up the model, uh, build a flexural model, you know, all called like, you know, um, set it on and so on. Um, and ultimately, you're making predictions, right? You're either making predictions in, in batch, right? So you basically take uh, some more data from either same CSV file or some other data sources and you make predictions. Or in more complex scenarios, um, you have, you know, um, an endpoint that's basically being called where your model is having predictions and that, that's basically real time, real time predictions. Um, one thing that one thing that you need to do um, if you actually start building this kind of system, this is what we I would say we recommend uh, when people want to build a machine learning system, is that um, these are independent components. Um, we can look a little bit later in like how you build them, um, but the, the, the underlying the underlying benefit of this is that a um, you can have like different languages and different frameworks to build each and every uh, stage of the pipeline, and then. You can also have different team members doing that, right? You can have a team member responsible for creating the features, um, or an entire team responsible for creating the features, an entire team responsible for building models, and then an entire team responsible for actually uh, models in production. Um, what we actually, uh, what we actually think you should do as well is um, that's where kind of options come into the picture. You need a way to uh, communicate um, and for the different pipelines to basically exchange information, exchange features. Um, exchange the actual model weights and, and, and so on, right? So that's where Opsox, uh, we see Opsox fitting into this architecture. Um, essentially, again, feature pipeline. Um, so Opsox provides the API, we we'll see in a second, um, and the UI um, for, um, let's say, feature pipeline to be able to register the features, for a training pipeline to be able to retrieve those features, and then we go to the inference pipeline to be able to um, retrieve the features, more features of data in either real time or batch to be able to make uh, predictions. Now, um, the specific project we're going to be looking at is uh, it's a it's a it's a um, it's a project to determine whether or not um, 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 a loan should be approved um, and an application should be approved. Um, but before getting to the model itself, uh, we want to start thinking about um, we want to start thinking about the different stages as we explained, and we want to start thinking about what we need from each and every stage, right? Um, so the left side, we start from the left side, is data management, right? Let me just. This is more like, okay, where is the underlying data coming from, right? This is, uh, you have different options. Uh, most likely, if you're working in a in a company, um, your data comes from most likely different data sources. Um, you have data coming from either a data lake like S3, for instance, or you might have data warehouse like Snowflake. 
uh, you might have um, streaming data, you might have um, a graph database. Um, so this is basically all the data sources you need um, to be able to, to kind of uh, build the features you need to, be, to automatically train your model. So um, the, now, the, the second step is, is that what, what the feature pipeline, which is basically um, you know, how to build the actual features. Um, the feature pipeline is responsible, as you said, to take the um, under the data from the external data sources, uh, create the features, and register them with the feature store. Uh, potentially, you can also use it to um, manage the labels. Uh, we'll see later these options in OpenSource API to, to be able to do that externally. Um, obviously, you know um, how and where your, your model are trained, um, which framework you're going to be using, um, and where specifically you train the model. You need to be used which kind of hardware you need to, to be able to train the model. And finally, um, the uh, inference pipeline um, is all about how you make predictions, right? Um, do you actually have all the data in the feature store? Can some of the data might, might only be known when um, when a request is sent in for a model to predict? Um, and also, um, does, the, does the prediction need to happen in real time? Uh, what kind of SLAs do we have uh, to be able to return a prediction? And, you know, or this can be, for instance, um, can be, for instance, a, a, let's say, a, a batch prediction. And finally, you know, how, how is the how are the prediction consumed? Um, in our example, we're going to build like a like a quick radio UI um, to show the predictions. But this might be another service uh, or maybe another user uh, consuming consuming those predictions. And these are some of the options that we have available. Um, as I said, we're going to go a little bit deep, deeper into into the details uh, later on. Okay, so um, before I, I, I jump into the next section um, and look at the different uh, stages of those pipelines in, in a practical example, um, you can follow along. Um, there are two uh, links you actually need. Okay, this is not a bit of a problem. Um, you can actually, you can actually uh, there are two actual links you need, to, uh, to, need to, to be able to follow the tutorial. The first one is app.source.ai. Um, that's our uh, service deployment. It's there, it's free for everybody to, to join. Um, there is no need for registering credit card or payment in general. Um, it's there, um, you're gonna get access to it even after the uh, tutorial is, is, is done. Um, you can use it to build you know, side projects and you know, experiment with things um, and, and it's there. Um, the second one is um, our tutorial uh, repository, so it's github.com slash logs slash opsource slash tutorials. Um, here you can find a, a bunch of different tutorials. Let me just one second. <coughs> so here you can find a bunch of different tutorials that we are available. Um, they all follow the same pattern. Um, for this specific one, uh, we're going to be looking at the loan, loan approval process. Um, and we're going to be looking at different the different notebooks, what they're doing, what kind of um, what kind of uh, abstraction they're using, abstracts and so on. Um, but you can also oops. Uh, we can also um, you can also look at the, the others. We have some example in streaming. Um, we have some example of streaming in in, uh, in, uh, in Python uh, using a tool called Pytorx. We have some example in, in, in Spark, Flink, and, and so on. Um, yeah. Today we're going to be focusing only on Python, so this is the only thing, only the things you need uh, to, to, to get to get running. Um, if you have any problem with like setting up an account or anything like this, uh, there is a there is a, a person in the back uh, with the same T-shirt like as mine. Um, yeah, feel free to raise your hand, and it's going to come and help you out essentially. Or we can, you know, you can stop me after the talk, and it's not going to be any problem. Okay, so um, what's the what's the specific example about? Right, so um, this specific example is, as we said, um, let me actually jump here. Um, this specific example is basically looking at um, data coming from a platform called Lending Club. Um, Lending Club is a peer-to-peer -peer platform uh, that where basically people can you know lend money to each other. Um, and the nice thing about them is that they make the data available um, open source essentially. Right, so you can basically download the data. Uh, periodically, I think it's daily. Um, they basically make available those some CSV file with uh, information about the loan applications and some information about the users and so on. Right. So, in this example, um, the ultimate goal is to um, predict whether or not a given loan should be approved or not. Right. Um, there's a bunch of different use cases that you can apply. 
a year, for instance, you can potentially build a model to predict what's your exposure in, term, in terms of risk as a as a lender or um, as a borrower or as a platform. Um, and so, in this specific one, we're only be looking at um, whether or not the loan should be approved. Um, the first thing, if, if you remember the if you remember this slide uh, that we were looking at before. Uh, to like identify different stages. The first one, obviously, is to identify the data sources. Um, as I said earlier, um, the um, the Lending Cloud platform actually releases um, two um, main uh, CSV files. Um, I think it's daily, as I said. Um, one is the loans um, CSV file, and the other one is the applicant CSV file. Now, the way we manage um, data sources, the way we manage the feature pipeline, is actually by creating what we now source we define as feature groups. So feature groups are an abstraction that we have in Opsworks. Um, they represent a set of features that are um, referring to a specific um, to a specific key, right? So in this case, in this case, can be um, like uh, the the loan ID. Um, you will see in the next slide is going to be the the applicant ID. Um, it could be a user profile ID or anything like this, essentially, right? So you need an identifier. Um, what you can see in the second column um, is something called the event time. Um, the event time is really important when you're doing uh, when you're doing and uh, machine learning with uh, transactional data. So as data changes over time, and most most use cases actually do that, right? Um, as data changes over time, um, you don't want to you don't want to update the existing rules. You want to actually create new rules. And the reason you want to do that is uh, to be able to track history and to be able to um, correctly join and we see it in a second whether that means um, different features. Um, so that um, there is no data leakage, so that you're not joining uh, feature values from today with the feature value of tomorrow, for instance. So that's what the event time is used for. It's that available, and we're going to be using it in Opsworks in a second. Um, after that, we have a bunch of different features. These are a couple of different like features about the loan, so the interest rate, uh, the purpose of the loan, um, the loan amount, and finally, we have the, the loan status. All right, the loan status is what's going to be our label, as I said earlier. Um, you can use Opsworks to store also the labels themselves, um, and we have the API to be able to manage those. Um, you don't have to. Um, they, they not, they, the, the labels can come as, a, as an external data source when you're training your model, essentially. Right? So that uh, makes it a little bit more easy to build uh, more complex um, pipelines and so on. Um, the next, as I said, is, is the applicant. Um, same, same idea. We have the ID as the first column of the applicant ID. Uh, we have um, the another like event time uh, column uh, for the specific values of the applicant's feature group, and then we have a bunch of different um, a bunch of different features um, that are specific to the to the applicants. Now, uh, one other thing I was mentioning earlier is the the, 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 the value of the um, the value of the event time itself, right? So in this specific case, right, we have like user applying to diff to loans and potentially multiple times. Um, throughout the, the data set and between like known applications the user uh, let's say the user annual income might actually change right so um, it can happen for instance that like maybe a couple of years ago my income was really low and I couldn't, I couldn't basically qualify for a specific loan but then my income increased and so then I, I actually can qualify now right so if you were to join the features from the loan applications um, Maybe a couple of years ago, with my status today, there would be data leakage, right? There would be not about it actually at the desk, right? So, um, what we actually want to do is we want to make sure that when we are joining feature groups together, uh, when we are joining features coming from different data sources together, um, we are joining that in a um, point in time correct way, right? And this is even more important um, if you're dealing with more dynamic data sources, right? So, if you're dealing, for instance, with um, you know streaming data. Or we're dealing with like um, joining streaming data with, for instance, you know, slow moving data from data warehouse. Um, that's something that you you want you want to take into consideration. Um, we see that in a second that you actually you don't have to kind of remember this. That platform is going to take care of for you. Um, okay, so um, let's let's jump into the code and start looking at it a little bit. Um, we have um, three notebooks um, and like actually the like a like a, um, a radio UI. Um, the two notebooks are the feature pipeline, um, and then we also have the uh, train pipeline. And then the last notebook is a batch inference, and then the application is actually a real time inference application, essentially. So, 
if we first start looking at the first one, um, the first one is um, the, the feature pipeline, right? Here, it's important to uh, say highlight what a feature pipeline is and what it isn't, right? So, one of the things that we, we generally recommend when you build feature pipelines in Opsox is not to do um, encoding or normalization of the features. So that's usually a, like a really, like, like I would say, um, really frequent operation that you do when you train uh, models. Um, the reason we ask you not to do that before, when you, in your feature pipeline when you're computing features is that it really um, um, makes it hard for you to reuse features across different models, right? And the reason for that is, for instance, you might have different models that are looking at different subset of the data, and then obviously um, normalization will apply on the entire on the entire data set, and then make that, for instance, the feature will have to be used only for a specific model, right? Um, so we see in a second, um, you can actually postpone the normalization process um, all the way into the uh, into the training pipeline and inference pipeline, and so the features are mostly computed out of, let's say, aggregations. Um, maybe you're lacking some features, maybe you're joining features from multiple um, data sources, um, maybe you're doing some embedding uh, and stuff like this. Right? So all of this um, happened in the feature pipeline. One of the things that you would not see in the feature pipelines um, that we have in our example is the normalization. We would actually see it later on in, uh, in, in, the, in the training notebook section. Now, how do you write feature pipelines? Well, in this specific example, we're going to be looking at pandas. Um, Opsux has pretty much flexible um, uh, set of ecosystem that can keep like plugs in. Um, if, you're, if you're doing streaming applications, that's where, like for instance, stuff like PySpark, um, Flink, and Beam can actually help you. Um, there's a tool called Bytebox that does some of the streaming application in pure Python, so you can actually use that one to um, handle like streaming data. Um, you might actually work in a company that has a data warehouse somewhere, and so then at that point you might be actually looking at you know, just using data warehouse, the data from the data warehouse to be able to actually build, uh, build those features. Now let's have, let's, have a look at, let's have a look at the code. Um, and let's have a look at this one. Can people see? Can people in the back see somewhat? Perfect, amazing. Um, yeah, so there is actually a, like a zero notebook. Um, the zero notebook is actually goes through a little bit more in detail about the data set, um, what the different fields mean, and, and, and you know what the label mean, and so on. Um, for that specific example, you can just go through um, by yourself, um, and then let's have a look at the actual the actual code, right? So the first thing you see is that we're actually retrieving the data uh, from an HTTP endpoint. Um, yeah, we're retrieving the data for a specific date. Um, and we'll see that in a second why this is important. Um, this is the data set itself, and we do the same for the uh, for the applicants uh, for the applicants uh, CSV file. Well, this is actually a 4K file, but anyway. After this, we actually have two data frames. Um, here, we basically are computing, as we said, two different feature groups: um, the applicants feature groups and the um, and the loans feature groups. Um, in Opsox, you don't have to have like everything is in a single feature pipeline, right? You can have multiple feature pipelines, obviously. Um, here it's in a single notebook, and so in a single pipeline, essentially, um, just because uh, for convenience, essentially, just so it's easier to, to kind of walk around, right? So one of the thing I one of the I want to mention as well is the way we suggest people to organize feature engineering, right? So this is a notebook-based development. Um, oftentimes, when it comes to let's say uh, deploying models to production. One of the critical aspects um, that you uh, want to ensure is that data can see and it's always computed with the same pattern um, and the same type of aggregations and so on. And there are no breaking changes between different runs of your application. Um, we'll see in a second how we manage versioning in Opsworks. Um, but one other thing you want to do is also make sure that you can actually um, A, manage the code base that produces those features, and also B, you need to test those uh, feature transformations. The way we actually do that in Opsox, it's actually not necessarily an Opsox thing, uh, but it's actually a best practice that you can actually uh, implement anywhere. Um, it's actually to uh, write those features as feature functions and actually store them not in the notebook itself, but actually in a separate file. So that way you can actually see here, if I look at my, uh, the, features, uh, the feature functions for my, my applicant's feature group, uh, what you can actually see is that you, you have like for each individual feature, you have um, a different function, right? And then you can actually unit test these functions, right? These are pretty simple. 
um, but potentially you can have more business logic here that you want to unit test uh, to make sure that like if someone pushes a new change, um, the same uh, the same results are, are are basically produced, and so there are no let's say breaking changes essentially. And what actually happens uh, in Pandas, you can actually pretty do pretty easily do something like uh, data frame dot apply, and then you basically apply this specific um, this specific feature function uh, to this specific uh, column or multiple columns to produce your feature, right? And you do that for basically a bunch of them. Um, you can go through. Um, we are doing also some cleaning, dropping some of the features, some of the columns in the original data frames that uh, we don't care about. And ultimately, what's going to happen is you end up with uh, a data frame. Actually, we end up with like two data frames. One for the let's skip this part for a second. Um, one for the um, one for the applicants and one for the loans. And what you actually do, um, the, the, the entire um, process of registering your data frame with Opsworks is basically this, this basically these two cells. Right? So if you take, for instance, the, um, the, the loans feature group, the first thing you do is basically define what we call a feature group. So a collection of features that are available for, um, for, different, uh, uh, for different models to use, right? for different versions of the model to use, for different use cases and so on. Um, and here you basically define just the features that, that you have in the effect, right? So you're basically defining the name of the feature group, the version, and come back on the version in a second. Um, you can have description both at the feature group level, but also the feature level. Um, you can basically do, okay, I want, I want this use case to be uh, available online for real-time applications. That's where, for instance, the online enable comes into the picture. So here we're basically asking Opsworks, when we write the data frame, to also make sure that the frame gets written in the online feature store for real-time retrieval. And then we have um, the primary key, which is going to be useful later on when we're going to join features together. And the event time, we discussed it earlier, um, to be able to say this column is my, uh, my date time. Um, and the option is going to use this column to do what we talked about earlier, um, the point where I join um, between different feature groups. Right? And then ultimately what you actually end up doing, um, you can actually see it here, is basically say um, long the feature, long feature group of the insert and you basically provide the data frame that you want to write into the into the feature store. I really run this one, uh, as you can see. And so how does that look in Opsox, right? Um, so if you look at Opsox, um, this is my uh, this is my setup of the of the um, service deployment. I have a bunch of different feature groups that I've created. Um, Earlier on, and you can actually see if you look at the loans feature group. This is what um, I just created with the code, right? This is how it, how it looks. Um, we have all the features that are part of these feature groups. These are automatically detected by the uh, data frame itself. So these are the columns that you actually have in the data frame. The types um, you can actually decide add description so to make it searchable. Um, one of the other things that we uh, we we just skipped earlier on was the integration with greater expectations. Right? So if you are familiar with greater expectation, greater expectation is a very popular library to do data validation. And there are actually two aspects in Opsox to uh, monitor the data. Right? Because here, what basically happens, if you are running this thing in a company, what's going to happen is that you will have a team writing the features, and then someone else will need to trust these features and these feature values to be able to build a model. Right? So expectations are a way for you to kind of Establish what the community calls like data contracts um, to be able to say, okay, this is what when data looks like, right? And so, in Opsworks, you can basically say, okay, you can basically install the data expectation library and basically say, okay, I expect my interest rate to be between these two numbers. Now, I hope you're not going to get that loan for like 2000% interest rate, but anyway, um, ultimately, that's what, the, that's what the expectations are. Um, are gonna enforce. So if you write something that is below two percent, minus two percent, or above two thousand percent, then um, we uh, we have two options, right? The first option is basically to say I'm gonna trigger an alert and I'm gonna notify someone. Okay, you can actually do it from either from the API, but you can actually do it from the UI. This is how it's configured right now. Right? It's basically say um, notify someone that like something went wrong, but keep writing anyway, right? This is actually what happens. Uh, the expectation failed, um, and then we just it anyway. Um, the other aspect uh, you can actually do, you can actually set it in, in strict mode. So if there is an expectation that fails, 
Then at that point, uh, do not write anything and trigger an alert, right? So that's more for production use cases where you want to make sure that actually data, uh, underlying data is actually high quality. Um, there is another functionality that it's, it's, it's sort of in, in the making of source um, at the moment, which is actually more um, in the realm of like the data monitoring. So looking at how this loan speech of data changes over time, and making sure that like if, for instance, certain statistics um, of certain features um, diverge from what you're training your model on, then you get an alert um, so you can potentially retrain your model, decide to retrain your model. So this is actually, um, this is actually what, we, uh, what we created so far. Um, we have created two feature groups um, and we basically just register. We do the exact same thing for the applicants. We just change the, um, the primary key and the event time. And then we basically, um, we basically again, call the insert method for the data frame. Um, here we are doing um, the description tagging. So we, are, we basically have a dictionary with all the description and the specific column, um, the specific feature that we care about. And then we call the API to be able to tag that specific column uh, with that specific description. Right? So this is basically just uh, just some metadata uh, operation to be able to cooperate with the descriptions. So that's essentially the feature pipeline that I have here. Um, one other thing I want to I wanna talk about, um, additionally to, to what we just said about the feature pipeline, okay, we talked about the, um, you know, making feature functions uh, in like, like um, a small and to a, like a related to a specific feature so that you can unit test them. This is what I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about like how do we orchestrate this thing, right? Obviously, the feature part, one of the things, the one thing that distinguishes like let's say a simple model from an ML system is that new data comes in every time, every day, every hour, like in real time, right? So if you're doing, uh, if you're building a machine learning system, one of the things you need to need to worry about is um, obviously uh, orchestration of the pipelines, right? So here you kind of have two options, right? You can um, you can either do like time-based scheduling, I'd also just support for it. You can basically say, run this job every, let's say, every day, every hour or something. Um, the problem with time-based scheduling is that um, you, your pipeline might have like upstream dependencies, right? You might have a dependency from some external, let's say, um, external uh, you know, process that basically takes data from a database and dumps it to the data warehouse for your pipeline to just read it and, and create the features. Um, so if that upstream pipeline fails, then and you're doing time-based scheduling, your pipeline is going to run anyway, right? It doesn't have any knowledge about okay, the pipeline both has, has failed, right? And so this is where um, there are a bunch more like complex orchestration tools like Airflow um, and and Dubstep, for instance, that allow you to like you know specify those pipelines in a much more um, in a much more complex way, but also um, with much more control over uh, dependencies between different steps and, and so on. Um, we talk about good expectations and integration with OpSource. And okay, so now 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 we're going to the, the the actual training pipeline, right? So we have created our features, and they're available in the feature store. We have a pipeline in place that runs every every day um, and updates those those values, append new value and new values into it. Um, and so now we want to train we want to train our model. So when it comes to training our model. Um, the, the, the idea behind uh, a feature store is that you have um, tons of features there and you obviously not necessarily need all of them, right? One of the things you will actually see, and I want to show you now, um, is that if I look, for instance, at the statistics of the features and I look at the loan itself, you can see that, for instance, the installment and loan amount are basically correlated with each other, right? Um, so maybe I don't want to include them both into, into the same and into the same train data set because, I mean, they don't provide necessarily value of having both of them there. Um, so what you can actually do, um, there are different stages that you can do um, to actually select the features, right? Whether or not the feature is useful uh, in the first place, whether or not it's redundant, like, like we were looking at just now, um, whether there is no point in having it because it has no predictive power into, into the specific problem that we are looking at. Um, in some cases, especially if you're working with like in financial institutions or like um, medical institutions, you might have a more strict approach in terms of like personal uh, personal identifying information. Um, so you might have actually features that you can actually cannot use um, in in your model, and then you know you might actually have features that you would like to have but you can't um, 
I mean, they're too expensive to compute for some reason, right? So what you're actually doing is that you're basically, you're basically going around like with the shopping cart and basically selecting the features that you, you, you care you want to include into your specific model. And you can do that using the API, and we saw it in a second. And what we actually end up creating is we end up creating what we call a feature view, right? A feature view is basically an, like a metadata object that basically says this specific model needs these specific features from the two different, uh, for, for, from my feature groups, in this case, from the two of them. And the way we, it can be much more, more, uh, more, than, more than two. Um, the important aspect is one of those feature groups is actually what we call in OpsWorks a label feature group, right? So that's where the label kind of comes from, from my prediction problem. Um, and then we're basically attaching um, to the label all the, all the features that we can, um, that, that we want to include in my train data set. Now, the feature view is a, is a powerful abstraction, um, not only because it allows us to basically create a different subset of features to include in my specific model, um, but it allows us to do a bunch of different things, right? One thing, obviously, as I said, selection of feature, the selection of feature, features. Um, the other aspect uh, is um, identifying which one, which of the features is going to be my label, right? This is going to be useful later on in the inference pipeline because you're going to reuse the same feature view object to do inference. Um, to maintain consistency, um, and so in that specific case, um, the loan, the, the label is not going to be available, right? The loan status is not going to be available because that's what we're trying to predict. So here we're basically telling the feature view, this specific column is only, it's only going to be available at training time, but not at inference time. You can apply filters. Um, so um, feature groups, as we said, are, let's say, free agent features, right? They are available for everybody to use and to build different use cases, to build different models. And so ultimately what happens is that you can basically say, I have, let's say, all my customers globally on, um, all my applicants globally on the, on the applicant's feature group, and then I want to say, okay, this specific model um, applies for only the US customers, or only the European customers, or in this case, this model applies only for um, uh, loan operation, loan requests that apply for, for mortgage. And then the last part is what we were talking about earlier, which is basically say, now that I, 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 I select the features that I want to include, I filter them to the subset of features I, feature data I actually want to use in my training data set, now I can actually apply a transformation. Right? Now I can actually do the normalization, I can actually do um, the, say, one of the encoding and, and situation like this. Right? So it, this will allow me to basically build, for instance, another feature view, again, different filter, on the same feature groups, but with different, um, um, yeah, with different, with different, with different filters. And this is what we call uh, model-dependent transformations because they are dependent on the specific model. And in this case, they are dependent on the specific feature view, um, which is going to be used by a specific model. Um, feature view is actually, uh, oops, okay. Feature view, um, as we said, we were talking, I, I, I looked a little bit earlier, has two different APIs. Um, as an API for um, retrieving train data, and as an API for retrieving inference data, right? And one of the problems you, you, you face um, when, you, when, it, when it's time to build, let's say, um, production machine learning systems is, uh, especially if you are in a large company, what basically happens is that the, um, the people working on the, on, the, on, the, on the modeling side of things are not the same people that actually work on the uh, machine learning operations side of things, right? So you need to keep you need to enforce a consistency between um, what, you, what you have in your training data set, the type of features you have in your training data set, and the type of features you have in, your, in, in the data you use for inference, right? And the feature view does that, right? The feature view will um, provide the, uh, the guarantees that the data is the same, the same features are, are the same, um, same transformation have been applied, the same filters have been applied, and so on, right? So let's have a look at, let's have a, look a little bit at the code um, that we have here. So, if you are following along, that's a, uh, the second uh, notebook that we have. Um, what you can see here is, as always, we, we log in. I didn't show you earlier. Uh, this is how you take any Python uh, process and you log in into your own um, OpsWorks AI um, account. Uh, you'll be basically prompt to uh, generate an API key. Just click on the link, it opens the page on, on OpsWorks AI, and it's going to um, give you back a, like a key you can use. Um, so if you want to start creating a feature view, um, the first thing you do is create what we call a query object. 
Um, a query object is, uh, again, a, a metadata operation, a metadata object. It doesn't store any data itself. It's not creating replicas of the data itself. Um, and the way you create the actual, um, the actual query is by using um, the Python API. And here, if you're familiar with the way, um, let's say, you're merging data frames together in, in uh, Pandas, that's exactly what, what, what we're trying to do here, essentially. Right? So here we basically say, OK, from the known feature group, um, select all my features except these two. Uh, we don't want to include the primary keys in my training data set, and we don't want to include my uh, we don't want to include the event time in the data set. Um, so we want to exclude them um, and join them together with every feature from the applicant's feature group uh, except the primary key and the date time that we uh, that we have uh, defined earlier. Again, here we're not specifying any specific um, joining key. Um, it's again it's the same as, as you do in pandas. If you do that, uh, what Ops is going to do is going to be looking at um, the different primary keys of different feature groups, and it's going to join on the um, largest matching subset of keys uh, that these two feature groups have in common. Right? In this case, um, both the uh, long um, feature group and the both the long feature group and the applicant feature group have as a primary key the ID, and so. What, what the API is going to look like, are they gonna, what the API is going to do is actually going to, um, they're going to join on the ID as a, as a joining key. Um, what the API also is going to do is going to create a point time correct join. Um, that we looked at earlier. Um, this is a generally speaking a complex query to write um, because you have to align events at, at different rates um, coming from different feature groups. Potentially, here you can have potentially maybe five, six, ten feature groups. Um, and so you have to align um, the known applications that you have in your feature group, which is your what we call a label feature group, with all the events from the other feature groups, essentially, right? Um, and what basically happens is that you basically get back um, an object. You can actually have a quick look at the data itself and how it looks like. So here you basically just have all the um, all the um, all the features that are going to be included in your current asset. And then you basically register that with objects, right? Here you basically say, um, I'm going to create a feature view object with that specific name, that specific version. Um, loan status, as we said earlier, um, is going to be my label. And, and that's it, basically. What we're going to see is that we're actually going to see in the feature view itself, uh, you can actually see I have a loan approval feature view here, where you can basically see all the features that have been applied. Um, where they're coming from, uh, you can actually see it in a diagram itself. Um, and you can actually do a, a bunch of different things with the feature view. Right? So we said earlier, feature views are uh, what, what's a, what are used for either creating from the asset, but also to create inference data. Right? So if you look at, for instance, um, in this specific example, what we're actually doing is we want to train a model. And here we're basically saying, give me back a data frame. I actually give back four data frames, uh, which are split in test and, test and train split, and the test split should be 20%. This we are doing, here we are doing like a, like a random test, uh, random split. If you're dealing with, let's say, time, time series data, you can also do, um, you know, you can actually set, let's say, X amount of time to, to be included in my training data set, um, and, you know, a couple of other weeks or a couple of other months to be included in my, in my, in my test data set, right? So you can actually specify the dates beginning and end for different uh, for different splits. And again, um, the API know which one is going to be your label, and so you're basically going to get back. Um, you're going to get back. Let me see if I can actually find this one. Time is not defined. Not this one both. So in the, in the meantime, it should, should not take long. Um, in the meantime, what I want to talk about is talk about the the, um, the uh, transformation functions. Right? There are two strategies you can actually use here. Um, here we're going to be using um, scikit-learn um, transformation, like scikit-learn pipelines, and use that to actually do the transformations. Um, you can apply that. Um, you can apply that um, on your data frame coming in. It's not in option specific. Um, and you can register that, that the, the, the pipelines um, as part of your model with your model registry. 
Um, there is another thing you can actually do in Opsos. You can actually specify it here. Um, you can basically specify a dictionary and use the Opsos transformation functions. Um, they are a little bit more. Uh, they are a little bit more uh, limited in terms of capabilities. The transformation function coming from Opsos. And so, depending on what you're doing, you might get away with that, or you might have to kind of fall back on the um, kind of fall back on the uh, on the um, second uh, pipelines essentially. So, yes, what we were talking about earlier, we were just doing a bunch of like um, uh, encoding on the actual features before before actually uh, providing it to the to the actual model. And then again, this is just a simple model training operation, and what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to save that um, in the uh, Opsox model registry. So Opsox itself has a model registry component that you can use. Um, some people use like stuff like Android Flow um, and other model registry. Uh, you can save it on you know, um, yeah, a bunch of other uh, tools out there. Here we just save it in Opsox so that we can basically track the lineage end-to-end -end, uh, from the uh, future groups to the, to the models and predictions and so on. Uh, let me see if this one, okay. Um, okay, so let me go back here. We have created the feature view. Um, we have looked at, we have created the data set, we actually trained the model. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention earlier as well is that um, because we have this separation of what the feature group, what the feature group is and what the feature view is, um, and we said earlier that new data comes in every every day or every every hour or depending on, on the on the frequency. Um, well, basically, you, you, you can basically see is that, for instance, um, you can actually get new data coming in and use the new data to you to do inference, right? But then, you know, a month from now, you can decide to retrain your model, right? And so, what you basically have to do, if you go back to, let's say, um, here, let's see, this one, uh, what you can basically see is basically, you can basically get a new train disk, right? And this basically is going to generate a new train data set including all the new data that has arrived in the meantime. So this is going to be, let's say, training data 2 and training data 3 and so on and so forth. Um, the nice aspect of feature views uh, is that um, you don't have to, um, let's say, uh, you don't have to remember uh, which features are included, right? You can just basically ask feature view, uh, okay, give me back a new set of data to train my model, and then the specific model um, doesn't need to change. You don't. You don't risk. In, you don't get uh, into the uh, risk of, let's say, um, you know, breaking the architecture of the model, breaking the input, and, and so on. Right. So, um, and yeah, this is a, this is what I was saying earlier. You basically get as as you get new rows coming in, um, you get new trainers being generated, and then finally, um, you know, you can actually use the batch inference data, and then ultimately, when you get the label, you can actually use it for. Um, for training uh, new models and new version of the models. Um, we look at this one in the code, um, how to generate a data set, um, how to create specific pipelines um, in uh, specific segment pipeline for transformations. We look at how you can actually uh, register and create the model for it. Um, you can store some of the metrics in it, and you can store the input of your model. Um, both in terms of like training data set, but you can also store it as a, um, in this case, as, as, as a, you know, as, as, as type and, and, and values you are expecting. Um, and you can also store, and so this is actually to store uh, an example of the input, right? So you can actually test the UI, and you can have a quick example to actually test it. Now, we have trained our model, um, we have new data coming in every day, um, and so we want to make sure that every day, uh, we also are making new inference, right? So here we have um, two different use cases, right? We have a use case where we're looking at, for instance, um, uh, batch inference. So we're basically looking at uh, all the applications that came in yesterday. We're going to train. We're going to we're going to make a prediction on them, or we're going to be looking at um, we're going to be looking at the more real-time application where, let's say, um, a user is on a website um, and is making an application, and we want to determine immediately whether or not that application should be uh, accepted or not, right? So, um, let me actually have a look at the code, um, just one second. So, there are two different aspects that we said earlier. Um, the first one is the, um, the, the number three notebooks. So, this is more uh, the best use case. Um, so, again, here we are uh, retrieving this specific feature view object that we want to use for our specific model. 
Um, we're going to talk in a second about the version that we have there. But essentially, you can basically do the following. You can, do, you can call this um, batch data, uh, get batch data method, and here you're providing basically the start time and the end time based on the event time of the feature groups, right? So here you basically say, give me back all the loan applications that I've, I've, we have received in the last you know, 24 hours or whatever the start time and the end time is basically, right? So again, here we don't have to specify which features we want to include, we don't have to specify which transformations we want to include, everything is, is encoded into the uh, store into the uh, feature view object and you know, we can just basically get back a data frame and actually call this data frame you can basically get back and then we can basically call um, model.predict on that one uh, to be able to um, you know, make predictions of whether or not a, a specific one should be, should be granted or not. Right? So this is basically um, the, previous, the, the, the most simple example in terms of batch. Um, but we also have a, a, an example in real time, for instance. So for instance, here we have, let me actually, yeah. Okay. So here we have basically the same example, but instead of basically retrieving um, every new request, sorry, every, every day basically retrieving the, uh, the last 24 hours of data, we are basically having a UI that the user can actually use. Let me just announce it in a second so we can see. Object. Um, this is the line that we're looking at. We're basically retrieving that object. Um, again, the same information. We don't have to remember what kind of features are, are included, from where they're coming from, and so on, how they are computed, and so on. Um, what we've actually been doing is we call this different method right now. Instead of calling the get batch data, we call this get feature vector uh, method. Right? The get feature vector, vector method um, is slightly different because it actually goes to what we call the online feature store. Right? So if you remember all the way at the beginning, when we were creating the features, we said, I want I want objects to store these features on the uh, on the online feature store. And so they are available for low latency retrieval. Right? Um, the, difference, the difference here is that when you're retrieving data from the online feature store, you cannot ask for a time range. You have to ask for a specific ID. Right? You have to ask for, in this case, a specific user ID. Uh, they want to include into um, they want to use to to be, to be able to make a prediction of essentially. And actually, let me see if this one has created it. Yes, just one second. Yeah. So basically, imagine this, but in a more like you know professional way. Um, you can basically say, okay, I'm, I'm on the website of my bank and I want to apply for a loan. Um, these are the things that I I, I want they they ask me. Um, and what basically happens when I click submit is the following, right? So, a couple of things. The first one is we said that they're going to be looking at the get feature vector. And some of the features, though, they are not available um, in the feature store, right? So, for instance, I ask for a specific loan for a specific reason, right? The, in this case, the home improvement. Um, obviously, it's not going to be available in the feature store, right? Uh, because it's a, I just asked for it. Um, in that specific case, you get feature vector method as a way for you to basically say, um, ask the feature the feature view to basically um, inject some of the values um, and ignore whatever is coming from the uh, from the online feature store. You most likely get nothing back from the online feature store because again, it's all part of the same entity that doesn't exist yet there yet. You don't have an application there in your feature store yet. You will have it maybe tomorrow. Um, but in this case, you can actually just provide these values. Um, yourself, and if you have applied the summation function on this specific, so if you have normalized, for instance, the interest rate or something like this, um, the feature view object is going to actually do that for you, right? Um, so you just have to, to provide the raw value, and then um, the feature view is going is to actually normalize it for you. And that's just what happens here. Ah, okay, so one more thing um, that we're basically taking this specific, uh, this specific vector. In this case, we are actually creating a panda data frame out of it. And then just call model that predict and return the result. We are actually downloading either approve or denied. So if you actually click this one, 
It's actually, um, the first request takes a little bit more time because you have to set up things. But anyway, um, in general speaking, a couple of milliseconds you get back the data uh, provided that you have warm up the application, um, and then you basically get uh, back your result from, from this specific model, right? And then here you can basically just you know, keep changing your attributes and play around with things and see what the model predicts or not. Um, generally speaking, if you, if you try uh, at home, then you will see that the model is not, it's not great. Um, approves all the nonce, probably. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that's good, I guess. Anyway, uh, that, that wasn't the point of the presentation. But anyway, um, so that's kind of where we are. Um, one thing I want to I wanna talk about is um, how do we avoid breaking things. So I have a couple more minutes there. Um, if you remember, like every time I was referring to a specific feature to group object or feature view object, um, I was referring to with a specific version. Um, and the reason for that, oh, sorry, yeah. And the reason for that is to be able to do um, either both CI/CD, but also to do like stage or lot of things, right? So we said earlier in let me just jump back in the code. We said earlier in the uh, in the when we create creating the features is that we don't want to necessarily like work out of typical notebooks. I mean they're good for exp like exploration and building good POCs, but then ultimately we want to make sure that we are tracking changes, we want to make sure that we are testing things, um, and that's where the feature functions are coming into the picture, right? So let's say for instance um, I want to um, I want to drop one of the features because it's a duplicate, let's say. Um, what I would have to do in Opsworks is I would, have to, I would have to create a new version of that specific feature group, right? So I would have to go here, uh, down here, into the um, create feature group, and instead of having launch version 1, I would have to create launch version 2, right? This will create a completely independent version of my feature group, same name, potential same description, but it's different, different entity, right? And so when I actually go and look at where a specific Oh, yeah, this popped up now. Okay. Um, where a specific um, feature group is being used, I can see that in this case it's, it's used by the non approval version 1. So, loan version 1, uh, loan feature group version 1 is going gonna, gonna to keep being used in the loan, loan approval feature view version 1. Um, but I can also go and say, okay, well, I want to create version 2, I want to deprecate um, this specific version, right? So, I want to basically say every time you, someone is going to try to use version 1, we actually get a warning. We actually actually basically say, hey, there is a newer version. You might want to use it. Um, so I can keep running, can keep having the pipeline running in the background here uh, for um, all the models, the zero line version version one, and I can slowly like retrain all the models to be able to reuse the version two of that feature group that I created. And same thing happens in the same thing happens in the feature view level. Um, what you can see here, um, up here, you can basically say, okay, here we are using specific version, version one of the feature uh, group nouns and applicants, um, and we are creating version one as well of the, sorry, it's up here actually, um, version one of the um, of the feature view object, right? Um, if you were to select different features, um, if you were to apply, let's say, different transformation functions, or or, or like adding different filters, for instance. Then you basically you will have to um, increment the version of the of the feature view itself, um, and then ultimately, you know what that's that's exactly the, 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 what you need to remember in your training pipeline. You basically have to say, okay, I want to use version one or version two of my feature view, which ultimately going to be using version one or two of the um, feature group objects underneath, essentially, right? So everything is versioned, and, and you basically have um, a way to um, basically have a, like a big red button to basically say, okay, new version doesn't work, um, let's roll back to the previous version uh, of, of Opsworks. Oh, sorry, of, um, of Feature View. Um, and you can do the same, um, we, haven't, we, we haven't really touched upon on this specific case, we can do the same at the model level. Um, here in Opsworks, uh, if you're using the, the service platform, you can actually deploy models um, behind a, like a rest endpoint. Um, we use a tool called PageServe to power that. That's a, um, the model serving framework that comes out of Kubeflow. Um, and so, um, use some of the Kubernetes tools like Istio and so on to be able to do like network traffic. traffic. Um, and you can basically say, okay, um, you know, maybe initially you can have, okay, this doesn't make 100%, but anyway, let me see. 
okay, that there's some, there's some math error in the slide. You can basically say 90% go into the um, into the first one, and then 10% go into the second one, right? Oh, actually, okay, now that makes sense. Um, you send 10% of the traffic to both, actually, to the both the blue model um, and the green model, essentially, um, so that you can actually monitor how the existing how the existing predictions are are are, are doing, essentially. And that's what we talk about this. And that's everything I have for you. Um, I have ten more minutes, I think. Yeah. Uh, we actually have two forty. Two forty. Okay. But there's a break. Oh uh, yeah. And so there's a yeah. there's a break until three ten. Okay. Yeah. So if you have any questions or like uh, anything like this, um, just let me know. Otherwise. Uh, you can find me and a bunch of my colleagues um, in on our Slack. So if you want to try out the tutorial at home or um, to any point, then yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Um, they are here um, in slash logical box slash uh, tutorials. Actually, let me put back this one so you can take a picture of it. Let me see. Yeah. Yes, I will. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, yeah. There are other toys. Uh, this one here, down the one. So then you have uh, Z1 to three. And I think there should be uh, should be a requirements file as well. Yes, um, but the requirements are just installing objects and installing the radio section. Oh, actually, I can do that as well. Yeah, of course. Do you have any mechanism to detect drift? Um, not right now. Uh, that's something we're building in the background. Um, that's the that, that, that's what I was mentioning in terms of like, um, like, but the data actually meets certain expectations, and and you know it, either writing it or not uh, into the into the feature groups. Um, and then the other aspect that there's something that we that we are building right now um, is the data validation aspect, where you basically say, uh, look at the um, look at the statistics of a specific training data set, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, these are now deprecated. Let me undeprecate them. Um, you can look at basically the statistics of a specific training asset, um, and then you can compare them with the new statistics that you compute every time um, data comes in in the physical group. So one thing that you do, um, that I didn't mention, I just show really quickly, was that when you create new, um, when you create, when you ingest new data, you actually see that in the in the UI, you can actually see um, activity that happen. Then so like new rows that have been ingested. Rows that have been updated based on the primary key, um, and rows that have been deleted. Um, you can see like different metadata operations. Like in this case, we updated the expectation suite, um, and what you can actually see is actually different statistics as well. So every time you create new new values, um, sorry, every time you, you, you write new data, we take a new snapshot of the statistics that we can that we can compare essentially. Uh, yeah, but that's that's just something that that is going to come up soon. Uh, hopefully, yeah. Okay. Or the raw feature, do you store the information about the processing that was applied to the feature? Um, for some information, yes. Uh, depending a little bit on how you, depending a little bit on how you are structuring. If you're doing the feature engineering in source, then we can detect the code and we can actually store it in source. Um, in, like in this case, I'm doing it on, on my own laptop. Um, you be, you can actually attach the like the commit ID that you can actually have that you actually have for that specific um, for that specific. Um, for that specific commit, data commit essentially that you have here. So I can compute in the top slot yeah. as well? Yeah, you can compute in the as well, yes. Or you can compute it aside. So if you are um, you know if you if you already have like a Spark cluster for instance or you already have a flame cluster or a Python engine somewhere, you can actually you can actually use it and connect your outside cluster to, to write into source. Could you could you please show the model registry? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the model that I, I, I registered earlier. Um, um, so this is the, the, the landing model. Um, you can have multiple versions for the models as well. Um, you can actually do a couple different things. Let me see, actually, here. Let me see if I registered the example. Well, this is a simple example where you basically say um, this is based on the, the, the metadata that you have attached to it. 
Um, this is the schema that the model expects. Um, this is what comes out of the feature view object essentially. Um, so different different features and different type of features that, that we expect. Um, what you can actually do is you can actually deploy this specific version. So you can actually um, spin up uh, one or more Docker containers in the background um, using KSERV, as was mentioning, um, to be able to create a new deployment um, and be able to have an endpoint to be able to serve that. If you do that, then you can actually, um, you can actually, um, how do you say, uh, you can actually make a request to it, um, either through the UI or through the API to be able to actually send, send a request to it. Can I compare different ML experiments? Um, not necessarily experiments, unless you register them as models. Right? So if, you register, if, you, if you register the output of the experiment as model, and you attach the, the metrics that you have here. Uh -huh. So if you look at uh, this one here. Um, here you can basically see, well, we have one version of the model. Um, so that's kind of the values of the, the metrics that we attach to it. <laughs> if you were to have multiple version, you would have also potentially multiple metrics. Mm -hmm. You would basically have all the metrics for all the versions. Sorry. Yes, all the values for all the metrics for all the versions, essentially. Okay. And can I check the feature importance? Um, not like not out of the box. Like you would have to do it. Uh, you would have to do it yourself, essentially. Yeah. Um, is there a way to I think I think it depends on the deployment. So this is like this is the uh, this is the deployment we have up here for the community to use. Then there is a the also is also a company behind it. Um, 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 we have a booth tomorrow. Um, we can we can actually I can actually show you the um, like the enterprise version of it, so you can have a look at this. And that can, you can deploy it within your own uh, PPC on your own cloud or even on prem if you're on prem. Um, and then you can actually manage the uh, depending a little bit on where you are, if you're on prem, you also have to manage the infrastructure. Um, but you can definitely manage the, the entire process to uh, create the features, build the features, deploy the model, and then exposing the, uh, the endpoint to, to, the, to, the, to, to your customers, actually. So, <coughs> yeah. But yeah, if you're, if you're curious about it, then uh, we can actually, yeah, we can, we can, I think we are upstairs tomorrow, I think, something. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, based on what you just mentioned, so um, is there a way for you to uh, like choose what which backend you want to use for either an offline store and the online store? Like if I yeah. want to go with a Redis or a Dynamo yeah. or something? Um, yes and no. Um, you can use, you can use uh, so for a line feature store, no. Um, the line feature store is our own in-memory um, database uh, that's called OnDB. Um, the reason it's strict is because it's better performance and has a lot of nicer features. You can scale it up and down. Is that proprietary? Uh, no, it's open source. Oh, cool. um, it's actually GPL2 or something like this. Right. Um, the offline storage, uh, we are a little bit more flexible. Um, we can create um, what we call um, external feature groups, where you basically you can basically say this specific. You can basically tell Opsox this specific feature group is actually this SQL query running on this data warehouse, for instance, right? And then. Uh, yeah, we have actually such connectors here available. So then you can basically, I don't know, configure either BigQuery, Snowflake, Redshift. Um, you can have, um, you know, data lakes like S3, um, GCS, and there should be also a DLS somewhere. Um, but basically, you can basically have a, a flexibility on that um, to basically say this specific group is actually in my own data, and that's um, that's nice because you know, oftentimes you already have those pipelines in place, right? And you just want to leverage them um, into Opsox. Um and data, if you use external feature groups, so you mount it from outside, the data stays outside, so we don't bring it to Opsox. The only reason we need to bring it to Opsox is if you want to use the online feature store. So at that point, we have to take it from, let's say, Snowflake and get it into the online feature store for doing real time <coughs> and, and so, based on what you're mentioning, I, I assume that the online feature store runs through your infrastructure, and there's no way like. You know, it, it, yeah, it depends. It, okay, in this case, everything has normal infrastructure, but like it depends, if you're deploying within your own VPC, then also you, the online feature store can, can, can decide on, on, on your own infrastructure side. Um, so you have control over that as well. Um, 
we have, a, again, if, if you show up tomorrow at the booth, then I can show you a little bit in detail the, the, the control plane uh, to basically scale it up and down and upgrade mm -hmm. it and stuff like this. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. How much time to uh, the online feature ingestion to um, yeah, so we have some benchmarks uh, that are available. I think we are depending a little bit on the on, on the pipeline. So there are two aspects there, right? The first aspect is the pipeline itself. That's usually the most um, intense part. Like if you're doing, let's say, streaming application navigations, that's usually where the most of the time is spent. And then we have some override right to get data from, let's say, your like, Spark streaming application or Pandas application into the feature store. And then you're talking like sub cycle to, to be able to get it there. Um, in terms of retrieving it from the online feature store, um, we have some benchmarks available, and they are like we are talking single-digit milliseconds latency once the data is already on the online feature store. Right. Those are questions in the back. Yeah. Is there a way to see how the prediction values are being calculated, and can we tweak those? Can we answer? Is there a way to see how your prediction values are calculated? My prediction value in, in the model, or yeah, um, you they are basically they are basically just out of this one I'm seeing. Uh, what is the three? Yes. No. Wait. Two. Um, it's just a metric that you compute. Uh, it's just the dictionary that you provide in the specific um, in the specific value here. So you're basically computing the accuracy here. Uh, let's compute that up here somewhere. Uh, here. So you basically define whatever uh, method you want and just basically provide dictionary with metric and specific value. It's not something that like the, the, the moderator does for you. Okay. So great class five. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um,